Doves, welcome back. I thought I would kick off the new year with doing a video on Bridgerton, which is the new Netflix Gossip Girl-esque Regency period drama bodice ripper. Yeah. First things first, I want to do a short little review of what I thought about the series as a whole. <music> one I found it very entertaining but I thought the drama was a little bit lackluster. There are moments when the tension kept building and building only for it to fall flat. Marina! Mama! Mama make it! I'm already feeling much improved. Marina. I was also annoyed with Simon for the majority of the show. I mean he's definitely the most attractive guy in the cast but his emotional constipation and unhandled trauma was not sexy. If I was Daphne, I would have just married the nice guy who didn't have commitment issues, gave me a Swarovski necklace, and would increase my rank to literal princess. But I don't know, that's just me. Don't sit there and tell me that marriage isn't an economic proposition because it is. Another problem I had with the romance was that Simon and Daphne fell in love so quickly. I don't know how many seasons Bridgerton is going to go for, but this is a period drama. Even if it's not fully historically accurate, I think it still goes into the category of period drama. And I assume most people watching the show are period drama enthusiasts. And one of the major tenets to any romantic period drama is the slow burn. The wedding should have been at the end of the season. There should have been way more yearning. Think about the tension we could have had. I wanted to see some collar pulling because Daphne flashed a bit of her ankle or something. Another problem I had was how Lady Whistledown's identity was revealed right at the end of the season. I thought it was way too early to do that reveal. Like I would have liked at least another season. Um, I hope it's a red herring, but I guess we won't know until season two. There was also a very questionable sexual assault scene that was just glossed over and never addressed. As for the diversity point, because I know I have talked about how much I like diversity, as everyone should, in my previous videos, but yeah, I am really excited about how Shonda Rhimes was the executive producer and how the leading man was a black man. I was also excited about the historical anachronism because, you know, in a lot of these period dramas, the costumes are very elaborate and fun, and why should only white actors get a chance to take part in it? But with that said, I thought it was a little weird and unnecessary for the show to try to justify its post-racial society. We as an audience know that there were violent racial tensions during the Regency period. We know the history and we also know that this is a very candy-colored fantasy version of history. So it honestly pulled me out of the moment when this conversation happened in the show. We were two separate societies, divided by color, until a king fell in love with one of us. Like I'm supposed to believe that just because there was an interracial royal wedding that racism is magically gone? Sounds unlikely. These are just my qualms with the storytelling in general, but let's get down to what you actually came for, the costumes. For some context, so that we're all on the same page, Bridgerton takes place in 1813 in Grosvenor Square in London, England, for the most part. Costume designer Ellen Mirajnik and her team created about 7,500 costume pieces. Daphne Bridgerton, the main female lead, had about 104 costume changes throughout the season. That's a ton of clothes, and I definitely want to congratulate Mirajnik for that feat because most of the clothes were also bespoke, meaning they were made custom for the show. For her design process, Mirajnik said that she wanted to add a bit of modern sensibility and a layer of imagination to the costumes. She increased the amount of glitter, color, and over embellished the dresses. She also didn't want to include any bonnets. They ask you how you are, and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. She also cited the artist Jeanie Figgis as a major inspiration. Other inspirations include 18th and 19th century portraiture, the 1940s, 50s, and 60s couture, and modern couture, such as Chanel's 2017 runway shows. They borrowed Swarovski tiaras from their archives and had a custom jewelry maker on the team to make all the jewelry. The corsets were created by Mr. Pearl, who is a legendary corset maker. Mirajnik said that they made mostly half corsets or transitional stays as some fashion historians call them. These transitional stays extend to the top of the ribs to accommodate the empire waist silhouette. 
If you can't tell, I'm wearing reproduction transitional stays. Now, the interesting thing about transitional stays and in general corsetry during the Regency period is that they were very unrestricting. The silhouette of the Regency period was very natural and flowing and focused a lot on drapery. So it was really weird for me to see tight lacing in this show. Like, what is the point of tight lacing? What are you tightening? The dresses don't even have cinched waists. The dresses are literally shaped like tubes. Some stays at the time didn't even have bones because, again, like, literally no waist. I mean, I think it's always weird to see tight lacing in shows and movies, but especially during shows and movies that take place in the Regency period, it's just, I can't let that slide. And don't get me started on the lack of shifts. I'm really tired of all this bodice ripper media thinking that shifts aren't sexy enough to be included. I do want to point out that Prudence Featherington is wearing longer stays and that is okay because they were worn as well, but I would have preferred her to be in shorter stays. Again, she's probably wearing longer ones in the scene so that they can do the whole dramatic tight lacing bit. A glimmer of displeasure <laughs> and a young lady's value plummets to unthinkable depths. But according to the book, Regency Etiquette, The Mirror of Graces, which was published in 1811, the author states that longer stays are only really acceptable for elderly women or women who were larger to help them redistribute body fat. This is also most likely why we see Marina in longer stays to hide her pregnancy when she was wearing shorter stays a few episodes earlier. So my first impression of the dresses in the show is that they are very, very inaccurate. Surprise, surprise. We see a lot of organza sheer fabrics layered on top of satin fabrics, bold bright colors, and garish anachronistic patterns. I don't mind these things on their own. For instance, I loved the costumes in Marie Antoinette. But my number one problem with the dresses in the show is that a lot of them looked very sloppy in terms of fit. The empire line for some of these dresses would cut across the mid boob like that and it just looked so awkwardly placed. I was also bothered by how many of the characters wear the exact same kind of dress for all occasions, morning, afternoon, and evening wear. Some of the gowns Daphne wears for the balls are very nice on their own, but they look so similar to what she wears during the daytime that they don't end up making a statement. Evening dresses are supposed to be more elaborate and detailed than morning dresses, and ball gowns especially are supposed to be super ornamented. Eloise is probably one of the only characters that wears proper daytime attire. Usually morning dresses had higher necklines or necklines filled with a chemisette or a fichu. If a woman wanted to show more décolletage, that was left for the evening. Let's take a closer look at the characters. According to Mirajnik, the Bridgertons dressed in powdery colors to represent how they are at the top of the social strata. She wanted their dresses to be very sophisticated and elegant, similar to the dresses of Dior, Chanel, and Givenchy in the early 20th century. The Bridgertons are normally dressed in one color at a time, which is perfect because according to Regency etiquette, diversity of colors bespeaks vulgarity of taste. I don't mind the color palette either because pastel colors were in vogue at the time, Blue, their main color, also symbolizes stability and wisdom, which represents this upstanding family quite well, in my opinion. I actually would have preferred for this family to look more classically Austin, and I know the whole point of the show was to upgrade the Austin look, but this family is supposed to be very proper. They're very polished. They follow the rules. By the way, when I say classically Austin, I don't mean boring. Like, let's take a look at some of the costumes from Emma 2020. In these costumes, you can see the level of care and detail in constructing all the trimmings and accents of each dress, and the finished product is just so, so chef's kiss. And unlike what Mirajnik says, you can have period accurate colorful clothing. In another interview with Vogue, Mirajnik said, another no-no were muslin dresses. There's a limpness to them that we didn't want. Again, limpness where? <laughs> Something I will give the show credit for is how the men wear colorful clothing as well, and specifically colors that match their households. Colin wears a notable bright blue cravat, some of the Bridgerton waistcoats are also blue, and the men's frock coats are sometimes a dark blue as well. Eloise is probably my favorite in terms of costume. She wears a chemisette in every scene until the end when she's kind of forced into dressing more mature. It matches her character to be modest and not to draw any male attention to her chest. 
I also like how the details of the chemisette mimic a bow tie or cravat, as well as how her Spencers have a kind of waistcoat collar detailing, which gives a masculine touch to her otherwise very feminine pastel clothing. As for Daphne, I was extremely underwhelmed. I'm not going to talk about her hair because period dramas rarely ever get Regency hair right, and they definitely prioritize the modern sexiness of long flowing hair over what was decorum. But here's a few photos of what hairstyle Daphne should be wearing. Mirajnik wanted to emphasize a very pristine and simple look for Daphne's costumes, even comparing Daphne to Grace Kelly in an interview. Daphne barely strays away from the colored blue, even wearing blue jewelry when she's wearing cream colored dresses. Having a family color is one thing, but only wearing the family color is another. I wish Mirajnik was a little bit more loose in her use of color, like I would have much preferred Daphne to wear different kinds of pastel dresses, different colors, um, but have her main color be blue or have like accents in her dress be blue. But having her wear a hundred different dresses of the same color in very similar and simplistic styles is so boring. Before you comment, I did see that she transitions into purple after she gets married and when she's in her honeymoon phase or just whenever she's trying to make amends with Simon. I didn't mind this. Purple makes sense because Simon's color is red and hers is blue. I also really like how in the gambling scene, Daphne wears a periwinkle shade dress that looks either more blue or more purple depending on the lighting. During the scene, her and Simon's relationship is on edge and we don't know whether they'll work it out or if they will live independent lives. So the dress color is totally representative of this. You will know then which vow you have broken and how we are to spend the rest of our lives. Miserable, together, perfectly happy apart. What I don't like is how Simon never really wears purple. I feel like it's the most visual symbol of family if they develop a mutual color together, but his wardrobe actually barely changes from morning to evening, from episode one to episode eight. We always see him in dark colors, velvet, and gold brocade. Mirajnik put him in a dark, sexy palette to juxtapose Daphne's pastel soft color scheme, which is fine and dandy, but one would expect that as he transitions to Family Man, his dark, alluring palette shifts a bit to reflect this. His facial hair is also period inaccurate, but once again, I'm not trying to stay on the topic of hair for longer than five seconds in this video because it's a losing game. Lady Danbury is Simon's maternal figure, and she matches with him via the red color scheme. She's also one of the best dressed in the show, in my opinion. Her signature look is the standing collar, which is fine because we see some of those in the Regency period. Take, for instance, this 1810 Spencer jacket. I think the collar gives her this regality because most popularly, we associate the standing collar with Queen Elizabeth I. Unlike the Bridgertons, the Featheringtons are new money and they aren't educated in the same way. In the novel that the show is based on, the Featheringtons are characterized as ugly, tacky, and citrusy. And so they're dressed in bold, anachronistic neon colors, greens, oranges, and purples. Now I'm a little torn when it comes to the Featheringtons wardrobe. Part of me is that I agree they should look tacky and gaudy because that's how they're characterized. Oh, mm. astonishing, Madame de la Croix. Well, because you were able to pay in advance this time and since I happen to have some fabrics, no one else seemed to want. But the other part of me is like, they've gone too far. Lady Featherington's empire line, for example, is completely unnecessary because they decided to cinch her dress at the natural waistline, which completely defeats the purpose of having any kind of empire line distinction. Her gowns also have a pentagonal neckline, almost a sweetheart neckline, but it's super angular and severe. This is no doubt to emphasize her breasts. I understand that they sexualized Lady Featherington to indicate poor taste because back then bearing skin was considered very tasteless. However, the way they cut her dress makes it so modern that I think if you looked at her dresses out of context, no one could tell that they were even partially inspired by the Regency period. For her character, I thought it was a missed opportunity to over-exaggerate um, Regency fashions in a very theatrical way. From what I understand about Lady Featherington, she is tacky, but she does care about propriety, so over-exaggerating and emphasizing her curves was overkill. I would rather they overdo her ringlets or give her comically large bonnets because I think that would be so much more creative and fun. And also you could definitely see that the historical inspirations behind her closet. I'm also confused at how she dressed her daughters to meet the queen in the first episode. These dresses are perfectly in line with what was appropriate. The girls are matching with Daphne for Pete's sake. So why does narratively Lady Featherington lose all sense of decorum after this moment? 
Also, as just an aside, let's talk about court dress during the 1810s. The show is correct in that young women presenting for the first time would be expected to wear white with feathers in their hair. However, hoops were still incorporated into court dress. So if we look at the fashion plates of the early 1800s, we see these really disproportionate looking dresses. According to A History of English Dress from the Saxon Period to the Present Day by Georgiana Hill, which was first published in 1893, the rigidity of court etiquette has always preserved decayed fashions. The effect of a hugely puffed out skirt under a low and extremely short bodice was most disfiguring. If hoops were unsightly before, they became ten times more so then. Obviously, I understand that they're not going to make the beautiful Daphne look like a potato, but I just thought it was a fun thing to point out. When I was first watching, the Featheringtons reminded me a lot of the evil step family in the live action Cinderella that came out in 2015. I love the costumes in that version of Cinderella. Sandy Powell designed those costumes and her idea was to mesh the 19th century with the 1940s and 50s. This is genius because the 1950 animated Cinderella, which is what the live action is obviously based on, did this exact same thing. We have a setting that is clearly supposed to be somewhere in the 19th century, but then we have silhouettes and hairstyles of the 40s and 50s, which were included to appeal to modern audiences of the time. I talk a little bit about this in my Disney Princess video part one. So I love that the live action Cinderella played with 50s elements in a totally anachronistic way. It felt like a real tribute to the source material. And even though the step family is dressed in these vibrant bright shades, the execution makes them look super campy and expensive rather than gaudy and tasteless. But you're not here to talk about Cinderella, you're here to talk about Bridgerton. Um, what I'm just trying to say is that anachronism can be done, it just has to be purposeful and deliberate. All the girls are debutantes, so they should be wearing white or pastel shades, but I can overlook that as a creative liberty. Other than Lady Featherington's weird silhouetted Joanne's clearance fabric dresses and Penelope's yellow dresses, the Featherington dresses are pretty okay. They don't even look as tacky as they could have because all the characters, including the background characters, are wearing colorful dresses, so it makes the Featheringtons stand out less. The only instance I really noticed how garish the Featheringtons were was at Daphne's ball when all the other guests were wearing blue. Which made me think, if the Bridgertons were given this very proper Austinian but, you know, still expensive wardrobe and all the background colors were kind of like dustier, clothing that blended in together, then the Featheringtons and the Bridgertons would pop so much more. Also, I do want to point out that Mirage Nick said her mission was to kind of modernize the clothing to appeal to audiences watching. In general, I don't think putting the girls in one gaudy fabric made the dresses modern. It could have looked a lot more relevant and creative, I think, to layer pattern fabrics, uh, literally similar to how Versace, a noted inspiration, styles their runways. Or you know how Mrs. Elton is dressed in the 2020 Emma with the exaggerated chemisette and funky hairstyle with the bow on her hair? They could have done this so easily for the Featheringtons. Placing random feathers on their gowns doesn't feel modern and is a little bit underwhelming, if I'm gonna be honest. One thing I did really like about the show though, because I don't wanna to be too negative, is that I like how the characters were cognizant of their wardrobes. A nice touch when it comes to Penelope, because she is given some pretty gross dresses, is how she voices how she doesn't like what she is forced to wear. Mine's perfect. And mine is yellow. You see, young ladies. This is also translated from the book. In Romancing Mr. Bridgerton, the fourth book, it is revealed that her mother forces her to wear yellow because, quote, yellow was a happy color and a happy girl would snare a husband. When she wasn't in the requisite white that most young ladies wore, and which of course didn't flatter her complexion one bit, she was forced to wear yellow and red and orange, all of which made her look perfectly wretched. The one time Penelope had suggested green, Mrs. Featherington had planted her hands on her more than ample hips and declared that green was too melancholy. Interesting, because in the show, the Featheringtons wear green. <laughs> For Penelope, I noticed that she clings onto pink more and more throughout the season, and I feel like this is in part Marina's influence. Marina's main color is pink, and Penelope definitely grows jealous of Marina's ability to win Colin's affections. I think it's a nice detail to have her try to copy the same colors that Marina wears. But even when I say this, it would really only make sense for Penelope to wear pink in scenes that her mother is not in. My mama had to stay home with her. Papa had to chaperone. I'm quite enjoying the fact that he is here. Mama would never allow me to wear a dress like this. Not to yellow enough, I think. <laughs> she admits that the only reason she's wearing this pink and blue gown in the first place is because her mom is not attending the party. 
So it doesn't make much sense how in several scenes in the show, Penelope is wearing pink around her mom. Last but not least, because I feel like this video is running pretty long, let's talk about Queen Charlotte. So Queen Charlotte is based on the real life reigning Queen Charlotte of the time period. In several interviews, including ones with Vogue and The Cut, Mirajnik states that Queen Charlotte never changed her late 1700s silhouette until the day she died, and that's why she designed her dresses to resemble the robe a la Francaise. When I first read these interviews, I was like, no way, it just doesn't make sense that a queen would be decades behind in fashion, she's a literal queen. And because I stick to my guns on these things, I took it upon myself to look up paintings of Queen Charlotte. And she is depicted wearing a robe a la Francaise in almost all of them, but these paintings are painted in the late 1700s when the robe a la Francaise was still in style. Luckily, I found a dress owned by Queen Charlotte that was on display at Kew Palace in 2018. As we can see, it is an empire-waisted, fashionable Regency dress. So, myth busted. I don't know if it's the mandatory court hoops that led Mirajnik to believe that Queen Charlotte wore 1770s fashions her whole life. But once again, if we look at fashion plates, these are clearly empire dresses with hoops underneath. Okay, everyone, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let me know if you kindly agree or disagree, whether you found other historical inaccuracies that I didn't talk about, or you know, even whether or not you just like the costumes or didn't like the costumes. Anyways, I'll see you all next time. And yeah, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day.